Hi guys, welcome back to the Super Data Science series on PySpark. In this episode, number six of our introduction to PySpark, we're going to be looking at continuing our example project, but first let's do a quick recap. In the previous video, we were examining the California housing data set and we were working with an RDD to DF and basically organizing our data so we get a good visualization since it's one of the key steps on getting started with your project is just being able to uh, examine it. And just to give you some more information, as we continue with PySpark, it's good to keep you know, asking questions, it's good to examine the documentation and just, and just researching the technology in general. So for some information you know, on why, why to uh, continue or why is it beneficial to use PySpark, and not in this specific case, but PySpark, PySpark is, or Apache Spark, PySpark, you know, again, the API, uh, built on top using Python. Its ability to process streaming data is huge. You have companies uh, such as Netflix and Uber that are continuously uh, integrating and working with PySpark due to that ability. You also have the machine learning MLlib machine learning library built right into PySpark. You also have the interactive analysis, which uh, is a pretty notable feature. Uh, you know, we have we haven't specifically mentioned it, but if you've strolled through the documentation, you have uh, MapReduce, you have SQL on the uh, Hadoop engine. You know, really the integration with SQL and, and Spark is a big benefit too for anyone who has worked with data previously. It's just something that is beneficial to work with as well. And again, you know, companies that are handling large quantities of data, you know, we, again, we're working with our California data set. It's not the uh, biggest file, but when you use larger and larger files, you'll see the benefits of using uh, Apache Spark and PySpark to, to process these large quantities of data. And to jump back, I just mentioned MLlib within Apache Spark. So for example, you want to see more about MLlib. You can check the libraries on the Apache Spark website, which you can find here. And for example, SQL and data frames, Spark Streaming, we have our MLlib and GraphX. You have also some third-party projects, but we're taking a look at the uh, MLlib, so machine learning, which is the page we're on. And you can see, just for a brief information before we get back into our project, some of the uh, algorithms contained within MLlib were you know, already prepackaged and built in. So you have classification, uh, regression, decision trees, clustering, topic modeling, and some workflow features and other utilities as well. You can click on the MLlib guide for use as example, just to become more familiar with the benefits of using Apache Spark and PySpark, you know, having those built in where you don't have to custom code a k-means cluster or a uh, logistic regression algorithm just to run on your data, having them built in. Again, just gonna save you time in the long run. Let's take a look. For example, you want to see logistic regression in Spark. Okay, so you look it up. You can see uh, right here, I'm looking at the, with this URL, you can see the classification regression. So I wanna see logistic regression. How am I gonna implement logistic regression on my data? And you can choose, you know, again, we're working with Python, but you have Scala, Java, Python, and R. Obviously, we're working with Python. Let's take a look, and it gives you a great example. You're gonna see how to import it, how to pass it on your trading data, fitting the model, and we can go into this further. Maybe we will, um, in the coming episodes, we're definitely gonna run some examples with MLlib. This is just to you know provide you some insight to see how easy it is to pass in the MLlib and the features of MLlib, the algorithms that are already pre-built in, and the documentation, again, are always key. Just because another essential part of working with these technologies is looking up information in the documentation. So you have the Python API documentation, you have this as a reference, you know, it's just great to have. But that being said, let's jump back into our project. So launch your Jupyter Notebooks, bring up the file, and we will continue working with the California housing data set. So let's work a little further with this. You have a general visualization as you've seen before, we pull out at the 50 rows, but say you wanna run a comparison between two specific columns that we have. All right, you're looking, I don't know, for example, let's say, let's take the first one, households. We wanna compare households to population, all right? So what we can do with our, since we have a data frame, we can run the df.select query on it. So we're gonna pass in our names of the columns. We're gonna run households. And then we're gonna also compare it to, we want to look at population. All right, let's take a look at population. 
and you have to pick your values again. How many do you want to show? We did 50 earlier. Let's do 30. All right. So we're going to run that. And you can see it just condenses. You know, you are looking at two specific columns now instead of the entire data frame. All right. Let's continue a little more with our California data file. All right, so we have our households and populations side by side, just a basic, very basic, easy representation. You only can take away a basic generalization just from exam, uh, examining that information. But let's say we want to divide. We want to see the comparison of households to population. So what can we do or how can we pass that in? We're going to end up setting a new variable and adding it onto the data frame to visualize it. So let's do that and get it set up. Let's take a look. We're looking at population divided by and comparing to households. Let's do uh, something called, let's call it, uh, let's call it house pop, house population. Call it whatever you want. But before we get there, we actually need to import from PySpark.sql.function import. We need that module of the package so we can use the uh, column. Now we have our variable set. We are going to take our data uh, data frame. We want to run dot select. We're going to specify the columns that we're working with. And we're looking at households, close parentheses, divided by column, population may not be the most extensive math, it may not even make that much sense, but we're just looking to run our basic PySpark operations. This is you know the main goal, just to get you comfortable working with these here. All right, let's move on. We're gonna run that. Oh, I knew that syntax was coming up because I was missing a parentheses. So we fixed that. Yeah, the red kind of just gives it away. Now, we run that. Just make sure I had it run through. Let's set our DF. We have to add on the column to the DF. DF dot DF dot width column. We want to do our variable of house pop. Set it for column. Households, close parentheses, divided by column, population. We have our two closing parentheses. We're going to run that. All right. And then we want to run df.show. And again, you can pick the amount of columns that you want. Let's run 40 this time. Do 40. All right, and as you can see, you know, it's not the cleanest right now. Our values are conflicting, but the takeaway is that we have added this to our data frame. For general reference, you can now run mathematical operations on the data and extract more features. And as before, as we pass in, we can actually call up the specific column, because remember, if we scroll up, we have our eight that we have passed into the data, uh, data frame and then we just added one so we're going to run df9 just to give you an example and it'll show you our column as rooms per and all right for this video again we were keeping it simple i hope you're becoming more familiar with the operations as we work through them they're not the most complex we're just working with some general housing data which is fantastic gets you some uh, you can now run and extract other features i hope i encourage you to build and extract further upon this data file. And one quick note, as we were scrolling through and looking at the values that we just passed in, I actually wanted to wait until the next video, but I think it's uh, a good idea to pass it in now because we can get it done with and then we can focus on the next video on something else. You see how we have our housing population, uh, our, our numeric values, you know, they don't seem uh, corresponding to housing population or housing data. And for the purpose of these videos, like I've said, I just wanted you to focus on the basic operations of working with RDDs and data frames. But 
now, since we have a, a solid understanding, you know, when we're working with it, you also should, it's a good idea to just pay attention to the values that we're working with, because if something seems off about them, you can always check the data file. So for example, say we pull up the data file of the housing data and you see these values, you know, something uh, would be off, if you would say, if you're looking at this. And one thing that we didn't do, which we have to go back and we'll run right now really quickly just to get the correct values passed in, is that we ignore these because I just was experimenting with them. We have to split the lines to get the correct values in our RDD. So if you scroll back up where we uh, passed back in our housing data, you could take the, just have to add this key line in. It's the RDD, RDD map, and in parentheses, lambda line, line split with the comma because we're going to split the lines. So if you rerun that, and we're going to rerun everything from the top, we're going to run rerun that. We want to rerun uh, creating our data frame from the RDD. We're going to rerun our columns. Columns will stay the same. You can rerun count. We have ju we just have it in there. DF show. And now you're going to see some differing values come up. DF show again. And our DF select households and population. Now, working with data, you know, again, it should have been passed in earlier. That is my fault. But I want to take the main operations of working with DFs and RDDs, but the data should line up as well. It was just one quick line split. So it's a process of debugging as you go through, you know, you always just have to keep an eye on your data just to make sure everything uh, makes sense. And you can rerun these as well. And if you show the data now, you'll get more accurate be um, representations between households and population. Just remember, it's always a good idea, you know, once we visualize that in the beginning, I was waiting towards the end because I wanted to include it in the next video, but we can just take care of it now. For the next video, we're gonna get into some other interesting machine learning algorithms within PySpark. And more specifically, in the next video, we're gonna be taking a look at collaborative filtering, which is, if you look at the PySpark documentation, it's referred to a commonly used ML algorithm for recommender systems. It's a technique that aims to fill the missing entries of a user item associated matrix. And we're gonna be looking at how in the PySpark documentation, they actually use the movie lens data set and run the collaborative filtering off of that. It's gonna use a little bit of a uh, regression evaluator and some other interesting methods to extract data using collaborative filtering. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, subscribe to the Super Data Science channel where you'll get weekly up-to-date information, some really amazing stuff going on in the industry. Please share, like, and post any comments that you may have, and I will see you in the next video. All right, have a good one.